What's up, the squad? Back on another video. I'm Marcus. I'm Chris. Got the best of the niche. I'm pretty sure that's how you say his name. Yeah, I would go. I would go with that. The niche. Yeah. How do you pronounce his last name, y'all? Yeah, I'm not it's sure. The I don't know. Yeah. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe one, though. Definitely yeah. appreciate that if y'all do. Trying to reach 200k. A little close. Close. Yeah. Make sure you hit the like button, though. Hit the subscribe button. Please. I know I said that two times, but really need that if you haven't yet. Let's get in the video. And the reason I mention this is not, not to refute him, but to say as I'm listening to him talk, it occurred to me, wow. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah, yeah, as I'm hey, listening hey. to him talk, it occurred to me, wow. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. yeah. Fuck All right. You'll be getting that press. That press, you know, you, you get somebody that mad, you know they're in the wrong. Funding on American public schools has escalated fantastically. It has gone up many, many times from what it was, and yet the schools never seem to improve. And yet, we never see people like Jesse Jackson protesting outside the public schools, even though black kids can't get a good education seemingly anywhere in the whole city or in the whole state. Now, why is that? Similarly, healthcare. People say healthcare costs keep rising. Why do healthcare costs keep rising? Healthcare costs keep rising for a really simple reason. The guy who's getting the benefit is not the guy who's paying. Now, <laughs> now let, let me engage in a moment of speculative, progressive reasoning for a moment. We have a right, no less for healthcare, we have a right to eat. We have a right to food. Who would deny that the right to prevent ourselves from starvation is as basic a right as healthcare? All right, now let's have Obamacare as applied to food. You will now be allowed to go to the grocery store and order whatever you want. Fill up your cart, you don't have to pay. Somebody else will pay. What's gonna happen? The first thing that will happen is you'll take all kinds of stuff that you don't need. You'll fill your cart, you'll buy 12 cartons of milk and 45 cartons of bologna. And then you go up to the counter and the grocery store will realize that they can charge whatever they want because you're not paying. So they will escalate their prices. The basic idea is that what's going on, you and the grocery store are conspiring to rip off the taxpayer. Mm. A third man is being cheated. And so what's going on with free education, free health care, is the taxpayer is being ripped off. Simultaneously, the... And I, got, I actually got taught that not too long ago. I know that's probably sound like it, it's like dang like but I actually got taught like the literal like I knew some of it before but I didn't really know how that cycle went and you know what I'm saying I did like react to these videos and a lot of people like don't you know what I'm saying go back to music go back to man these videos are interesting the, thousands, the hundreds if not thousands of bills passed by officials since 2011 that have that have policed the woman's body and limited female access to contraceptives and to abortion. We talk about birth control and abortion. Let's set aside for Let one moment the debate about whether or not abortion is a constitutional right. I would, I would submit that it is not. You can read the Constitution, squeeze lemon juice on it, hold it upside down, it's just not in there. But let's assume it was. Let's assume it was sort of invisibly there as part of the Bill of Rights right up there with free speech and right up there with the right to religion and the right to assembly and so on. Here's my question to you. Why should the abortion right be subsidized when none of our other fundamental rights are? I mean, you have a right to free speech. Does the government give you money to start a newspaper? You have a Second Amendment right to own a gun. Is the government going to buy you a, a, a shotgun? You have a right to free assembly. You've got to do it on your own time. You have a right to a free ex exercise of religion. The government's not going to pay for your churches. So since the government pays for none of our other fundamental rights. you got to apply the pressure. What if they, they, they give you the play, you just got to run with it. Yeah. You guys got to run right. the place. Why does this right get to be in a category of itself? So let's imagine I'm walking on the, on the river bank or on the beach, and I have a sandwich. I made it. It's my favorite bologna and cheese sandwich. 
and I'm walking around, getting ready just to whip it out and uncork it and start eating it. When a guy comes up to me, and he goes, hey man, I'm really hungry, give me half your sandwich. And so I do. I give him half a sandwich. Now, I would say that this is actually a very virtuous transaction. Why? Because first, I am a good guy. I shared my sandwich. I feel good about myself, and rightly so. And the person who gets the sandwich is a recipient of a good deed, and so they feel a sense of gratitude and a sense of obligation, and maybe later if they have a sandwich, they'll share with some other guy. So it's an all-around, you may say, virtuous transaction. But now I want to run the same transaction, but run it through the government with slight modifications. So let's follow the same transaction. I'm walking on the beach, I've got my sandwich, I open it up, I'm about to eat it, hungry guy shows up and he goes, I'm hungry, give me half your sandwich. Now let's say that I answer no. Mm. Now in a sense, I'm not doing anything evil because it is my sandwich. Yeah. It is mine to give. If he doesn't get it, he's no worse off than he was before. I'm not oppressing him. I'm merely not conferring a benefit on him. But nevertheless, I've said no. And now something interesting happens. I hear a galloping, and here's Obama on a white horse. He shows up, he dismounts, and he puts a gun to my head. And he goes, hand that man half your sandwich. We should have did this reaction on my dad. <laughs> I want to know what he's going to say about this one. More, more to come. He's just, uh, he been, he been working a lot. Been, been working a lot, so. And he goes, hand that man half your sandwich. And so, I do. And so the outcome is the same as in my earlier example. The other guy ends up with half a sandwich. But now let's follow the actual transaction. First of all, I am a reluctant giver. I was not going to give him the sandwich. I'm forced. I have a gun to my head. It's, it's no virtue to me because I'd rather give up the sandwich than have my brains blown out. So I just chose the lesser evil. I deserve no credit. The guy who gets the sandwich, far from feeling appreciative, he feels entitled. Oh crap, only half a sandwich. Where's the other half, man? I'm really hungry. In other words, he's entitled. And so what I'm getting at is the same transaction that would be a beautiful and virtuous transaction if it were voluntary and in the private sector becomes a monstrous transaction. In fact, if you look at this transaction of the, the horseman dismounting and putting a gun to my head, if someone tried that in the private sector, they would be considered an outlaw and sent to prison. No, don't shout at me. That's a smart ass dude. Yeah, that's a good, that's He's a good, smart. Way, good way to put it. Uh, it's a real good way. I thought I was good at examples. Jeez, no, I'm, I'm telling you, like, that's yeah. serious. Yeah. That's serious. He considered an outlaw and sent to prison. No, don't shout at me. I'm defending fascism. No, I'm exposing you as a fascist. Because, because... <laughs> do you realize... Uh, I'm, I'll tell you how. You asked me a question. Hold on. They whole world clapping. They went there on the mission. Everybody else, they clapped. <laughs> yeah, they went there on the mission. Are you familiar? Are you familiar with the black shirts in Italy or the brown shirts in Germany? Do you realize that they would go to campuses? goons and would stand in the back of the room and when somebody tried to make an intelligent presentation and answer questions they would shout them down yell at them try to intimidate them and count as success if they could get the event canceled and the speaker threatened but see the problem is sometimes you get speakers like me who are not scared of people like you you recognize your frauds I recognize, I recognize that ultimately you are afraid of ideas. You're not willing to engage with me. Yes, you're afraid of ideas. You're not afraid of fascists. You think I pose a threat to you? I'm an immigrant. I came to America with nothing. What threat do I pose to you? Now, if we're saying that it's absolutely impossible to give that money back because it's too hard to trace, we'd have to uh, give money to the African tribes, we'd have to give money to people who are no longer exist, that's absolutely fine. But we have to understand that we haven't really come to terms with that injustice that's been perpetrated. And if 
You see this person smiling over here, this person smiling over here. We are admitting that no one, um, that no one is perfectly entitled to absolutely everything that their uh, ancestors were, uh, had stolen from them, then we also have to accept that there are people today who benefit from the fact that their parents and grandparents profited from this immoral system. And, and the way to deal with that is with a social safety net that enables everyone to thrive. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you there. Now, the first thing I'm trying to say is, this is a hugely controversial principle because it actually involves wrecking the freedom of a free society. You basically have to, to put it frankly, if we were to carry that out, go into people's homes and take their stuff. Take their furniture, take their cars. You don't seem to have even the guts to do that. You don't have the moral self-confidence to do it yourself. It may be, if I am advocating a rule of social justice and I'm advocating it for the whole society, before I persuade everybody else, let's say I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Christian and I believe everybody should give 10% of their wealth to help the poor. And I go, you know what? There, the Bible says this, the Bible says that everybody should give 10% of their wealth to help the poor. And somebody says, Dinesh, are you giving 10% of your wealth? And I'm like, actually no, but I did do some tutoring. And you go, wait a minute, aren't you advocating? Aren't you saying that there is a moral duty to do this? Why don't you do it? That I'm saying that the mm. southern economy was essentially a non-capitalist economy. Fact, its champions knew that. The defenders of slavery all attacked capitalism. But they it hated was, it, was in the, it was in the pursuit of profit, which has continued on since then, through the Jim Crow uh, errors, since the establishment of private prisons. Um, and it's, you know, it's happening to this day. It's, it's, Look, it hasn't changed. It's, Look, it's, 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 have you noticed that since doing these reactions, I'm not, I'm not saying that um, the younger generation is dumb or they like not, they don't have it all there. But have you realized that like a lot of the you know talks and interviews and stuff like that that it's always the younger people that has the most to say and they don't like to be open to new ideas or they don't like they just think one-sided things and not really get everything or the right thing and they hit or they can't back up what they're saying yeah i've noticed that a lot yeah facts and i, I feel yeah because they're not realizing that a lot of these people like Dinesh himself that he's a person that probably has been through it um knows what he's talking about uh, is older than this, you know what I'm saying? And, and look where he is, being a successful speaker, you know what I'm saying, to get out where he needs to get out. And I feel like a lot of the younger people try to challenge it. Yeah, they try to one up him. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's happening to this day. It's, it's, look, it hasn't changed. It's, it's, it's been capitalism since this country has been founded, and that capitalism is rooted in the slavery of this country. The dictator, look, the dictator of Venezuela, Maduro, right? When he died, he was a billionaire. So he was obviously in pursuit of profit. He was a socialist who was looting the country for himself. Was he a capitalist because he cared about profit? No, because capitalism is not just about caring about profit. Capitalism is about a certain way of going about business that actually mutually enriches all the parties involved. Otherwise, they don't do the transaction. If I go to apply for a job at a company, and let's just say they offer to pay me $1 an hour, Right? And let's just say that you, I say that's scandalous, that's slavery wages. If I don't take the job, I'm no worse off than I was before. They haven't exploited me in any way. They're offering me a deal, I'm free to take it or not. It's completely different. Exactly. And I feel like that's what a lot of people don't understand. Like, it's so many people that's like, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't work here and I can't do this and I can't do that. You know what I'm saying? Doing this and a job I'll offer you, you know, uh, Twelve dollars an hour. Oh, that's too low. Yeah. And then you go to the next job. Oh, I'm sorry. We we can't we can't accept. You know we can't we can't we can't get you because of this. Then you go to the next job. Oh, we can't get you because of this. Oh, you go to the next job. Oh, well, send this in. Oh, I don't have it. Shit. Oh, we can't accept you for this. Okay, let me go back to that job. That's what I. Oh, sorry. Somebody just took your position. Now you stuck with nothing. Yeah. Shit's crazy exploited me in any way. They're offering me a deal, I'm free to take it or not. It's completely different if they go grab me, put a chain around my neck and make me work. That's the opposite of capitalism. That's why, read Lincoln. Lincoln says slavery is you work, I eat. And the alternative for him is 
the hand that makes the corn gets to put the corn in its own mouth. For Lincoln, that's mm. capitalism. The Scandinavian model is really simple. Everyone benefits and everyone has to pay. In other words, this is not a soak the rich scheme. The highest tax rates in Scandinavia, 60, 70, and 80%, kick in on the middle class. If you make $50,000 in Scandinavian countries, you're in the 50% tax bracket. Not only are you at that rate, there's a 25% VAT tax on everything you buy, which is a regressive tax that hits the poor more than it hits the rich. The Scandinavians are into soaking the poor, and they don't make any bones about it. Their point is, if you want this package of benefits, we have the right to take half your stuff. Now, co contrast this with the deceitful way in which people like AOC and Elizabeth, we're not going to go after, they don't even have the guts to say they're gonna go after the upper middle class. They go, we're gonna go after the billionaires. There are 300 billionaires in America. We're gonna go after the billionaires. So in other words, what you have in, in American well, Scandinavian socialism is, I call it unification socialism. Let's, everybody's in the same boat. American socialism is division socialism. Let's take society, divide it as many ways we can, intensify hatred toward the group that is being demonized. So intensify hatred, for example, of the black against the white, the illegal against the legal, the, the, the poor against the rich, the gay against the straight. And so what you get is this thing that's now called intersectionality, which I guess is a marriage of all these different types of divisions. I want to suggest that is the very and exact opposite of what they do in Scandinavia. They don't do that. Now, very interestingly, there is one place in the world where all these features of American socialism are in fact present. And that country is indeed Venezuela. Union. Why did Hitler consider Stalin his greatest enemy and consider that Libenstrom to the east was the way to go and killed 80 percent of uh, sent 80 percent of his soldiers to fight the Soviets if they were basically the same uh, ideology? Very good question. Which is if Nazism and and what I like about it, like I'm not like I said, I'm not trying to call no, I'm trying to. But what I like about it um, to try to take something good out of you know these young people going up asking questions or trying to you know fight with them or try to argue with them. The fact that Dinesh can hold his posture um, and really get out what he needs to get out to, you know, put in a head at the end of the day, you know, new things to actually look at rather than look at stuff, stuff one sided. Yeah. Uh, ideology. Very good question, which is if Nazism and, and, and communism are both leftist, how come, do they, how come they went to war? First of all, it's important to realize that ideologies that are very close to each other frequently do go to war. The Catholics and the Protestants, the Shia and the Sunni. The Shia and the Sunni are both in the House of Islam. They actually agree on 99% of theological beliefs, but they've been fighting for centuries. Why? Competitions over territory and power and so on. Remember that Hitler was a national socialist. The reason that Hitler hated the communists was not because they were socialists. He liked that part about it. What he didn't like is that they were taking their orders from Moscow. He saw them as traitors to Germany. So Hitler's priority was socialism in Germany. Now remember that Hitler who went to war with Stalin was allied with Stalin. So on the foreign policy domain, Hitler was perfectly happy to sign the Hitler-Stalin pact and then violate it for reasons of national interest. So the bottom line of it is the fact that Germany and, and the Soviet Union went to war in no way refutes the idea that progressivism, communism, and fascism were all three sister movements that developed in Germany, in Italy, in America, and in Russia, all in response to the crisis of Marxism. And the reason I mention this is not, not to refute him, but to say as I'm listening to him talk, it occurred to me, wow. Get the fuck out of here! Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Anxiety scared of his ass. Cause I don't know about that. <laughs> it's a lot of, for you to yell at somebody like that in front of all those people. Boy.
See, this is the acceptable bigotry of the left. This is the acceptable bigotry of the left in which... <laughs> You have, this, you have this lousy beneficiary of white privilege, right? Now, if, now if, he knew, if, he knew, if he knew an ounce of history, he would sit here, listen to me, and stand up and ask a question that will show me up. But he won't do that. He won't do that because he's a thug. He's a thug who wants to shout me down. That's all he knows how to do. Open debate is not racist. Open debate is very healthy in an academic community. Racial denigration is racist. So I ask you in fairness, I've been up here now speaking. Uh, if you believe the posters and the dissenters and the comments and the Stanford paper and so on, I, you might have expected me to stand up and give you 45 minutes of racial invective. So a very good way to test these things is to ask you, have you heard me say anything tonight that you would consider racist? And if not, why would you even raise that term in my connection? Um, so I will concede to you, um, I did not hear anything explicitly racist. And I, I do have to say, I appreciate that. Thank you. The bottom line of it is you don't no. get to jump the line. So That's lawlessness. And not only is it lawlessness, but those of us who come from countries far away, this jumping of the line hurts us more than it hurts anybody else. It hurts legal immigrants standing in line from a long distance away who can't jump a fence and can't swim the Rio Grande. It hurts us much more than it hurts native-born Americans because we, our lives are hanging by a thread and these jerks jump ahead of us and it doesn't matter that they're looking for a better life, we are too. Yep. The Second Amendment does not exist for hunting. It's not ultimately about the fact that some people like to go shoot deer and they need um, sports weapons to do that. The real purpose of the First Amendment is to protect the citizens from their own government, from the risk of government tyranny. <laughs> okay? That's why it's there. That's why it's there. Now, the progressives want to dominate the state. And they want to have increasing state control over the lives of citizens. I'm learning. Dude. Having an armed citizenry yeah. is a major check on that. And I believe that ultimately that's what drives gun control. Because think about it. Uh, what gun control policy could have prevented Las Vegas? Even Dianne Feinstein said, I can't even think of any. Uh, number two, what purpose is served by taking guns away from law-abiding citizens if your point is actually to prevent non-law-abiding citizens from killing them. Remember Rahm Emanuel's never let a good crisis go to waste. So whenever there's some panic, they actually hope to ride the panic to pass a law that may even seem senseless three weeks later, but you did it in a panic. Um, and so um, the use of crisis is, by the way, the fascists were like experts at this. They used the Reichstag fire was what Hitler used to get the Enabling Act passed, which gave him essentially supreme power over Nazi Germany. He didn't have it before that. The parliament gave it to him. And he used a, uh, some say a manufactured crisis, that's debated by scholars, but nevertheless a crisis in order to claim that power. My question for you is more based on discourse. Um, in a climate right now with what's going on outside and what can happen in here, the word bigot being thrown around, um, how do we maintain a level of intellectual discourse that keeps conversation happening instead of not happening? This use of the word bigot, uh, you got to be very careful because when I was here at Dartmouth, I was, I was a freshman here in the aftermath of what's called the Berkeley Free Speech Movement. I've never heard that word before. What does that even mean? Yeah, no, I've heard it like before, but I still don't know what it means. I heard it like, in a, you talking about like in a video that we reacted to before? Yeah. Yeah, I did too, but, but I, I don't know what it means. explain what it means, so I don't know what it means. What does that mean? And it was all these guys who were like, free speech, free speech, free speech. And we supported them. Our newspaper on campus was partly modeled on the Berkeley Barb that was behind this kind of activism. It's only later I realized that when those guys take control, they will immediately start suppressing the speech of others. In other words, they don't actually believe in free speech. They believe in free speech for them. Mm. 
bigot is a very loaded term. And because it has real sting and applies to real people, there's an effort to try to... <laughs> the fact that he's just shaking his head. <laughs> real sting like, and applies to real people, there's an effort to try to pin it on people. <clears throat> See, like these guys are walking out, they're too lazy to debate with me. Not they're not going to. I mean, they aren't. They aren't. Because, I'll tell you why. Hold on. Look, I'm here. I, I'm here. institution and the standards that this institution upholds for you to say that they're lazy is kind of a bit I'm not saying that they're lazy people I'm, I'm simply saying that they are not willing to do the intellectual work to stand up face to face with me look if I said those things yeah. on those posters and if I believe them and if they're all true this is a slam dunk against me. All someone has to do is stand up here, quote my own words back to me in the complete confidence that I would have no rebuttal, right? And crush me. And I'm saying they can't do that and they're not going to, or, or if they will, I'm, I'm actually anticipating that and waiting for it, but it hasn't happened yet. So I'm just saying that... I'm saying they lazy because if they, if they really wanted to have a conversation and they really wanted to fight what they're fighting for, then they would, so exactly, they would have stood there, waited their turn, got on the microphone and had a conversation with him yeah. and said, oh, okay, well, you said this, this is what that is. If he felt like he was wrong in the situation, he looked like a gentleman that, a, okay, yeah, I was wrong. I believe what you're saying is true. That's fine. He just said it himself. But right there, like that, that gets on my nerves with a lot of people, a lot of people that uh, is from the left, and I don't. And, and <clears throat> by all means, we independent. I kind of y'all know what you know what I'm saying. Lean towards and stuff like that. Uh, you know, but at the same time of yeah. hearing what the left is doing, all these videos and like seeing what people and and watching these different news channel, what the left is about. Every time somebody has something to say, just saying it and just teaching, just what he's doing, getting out what he wants to get out, and people. Do disrespectful shit like that. It's like, can't damn. Can't sit and actually have a conversation. Can't sit and have a conversation. You rather yell. You rather spit. You rather walk around and be disrespectful yeah. when somebody's talking. You rather to throw. You rather to do all those things but have a conversation. And that right there just shows that you're in the wrong. That person that you're doing that to is in the right. And it, it just, yeah. it bothers me a lot. The enemy of free speech is not me. The enemy of free speech are the people who would rather have that I never came, that they never would have to have that kind of debate, that they would win this confrontation by default. Mm. I enjoy listening to what he has to say. Like, I really do. Because it's a lot of people that, that actually needs to, to listen to that. Like I say all the time, that I get every, and I mean every single day, reckless, I used to like you. Reckless, I used to like you guys. Reckless, I'm unsubscribing. Reckless, I'm... First of all, <clears throat> it would be one thing if they're leaving because I'm not reacting to music or I'm not reacting to this person or this. That'll be one thing. Yeah. A lot of these people are leaving just because I'm reacting to videos that's teaching me, that's I'm teaching say, Chris, yeah. different things. Stuff. Exactly. At the, the At the end of the day. You know what I'm saying? Not taking no, like, it, you're learning. And those are the same people that literally, like, a lot of those people, and I'm, I'm not saying that because some people, you know, because of the music, I, I completely understandable. I mean, that's fine. Some people subscribe for music and stuff like yeah, that. That's so fine. I mean, I, I, and regardless if they unsubscribe for us, it's fine. Like, I, I don't, I didn't make you do anything. Like, that, right. that's okay. But at the same time, is <clears throat> it sucks that a lot of people, not only sit there and try to watch these videos and watch the reaction to get our reaction and just see and to hold their opinion they don't hold their opinion they don't sit there and ask questions they don't sit there and recommend or send any course, links yeah, no wings or and that just goes to show me that a lot of people on the left is just in denial about a lot of shit and it sucks yeah. you know what i'm saying they don't know anything. facts make sure i hit the like button subscribe definitely appreciate everybody tuning in and watching the action make sure i hit the like button subscribe for more videos please comment down below the link or go to the community tab check it out you already know what's going on catch you on next one